So good morning, everyone. Um, so I thought I'd start out today as the commercial real estate reporter by showing some major headlines Nashville has made over the past few months. Um, maybe took that a bit from the mayor before this, but you know, some of them are the same. Um, so last October, um, Nashville defied odds um, by ranking as the number one market to watch for the third year in a row by the ULI. Um, the report called Nashville a supernova city, um, ranking as one of the fastest growing country, um, markets in the country. Um, though the report said the glow had somewhat faded for the category due to some growth causing some big city problems, I think we all want to make this year for Pete, so let's keep a watch for that. Um, just last month, Larry Ellison declared that he was going to make Nashville Oracle's world headquarters. Um, and this comes nearly three years after the company planned to create 8,500 jobs by 2031 on a $1.35 $1 billion 70 acre campus on the East Bank. Um, CBRE ranked Nashville as the number four market in the US for commercial real estate investment. Um, the Nashville area also ranks among the top five U.S. markets to have gained new headquarters. Um, Williamson County can take much of the credit for that. It has over 40, 40 corporate headquarters, and there's plans for more on the way. Um, if the Oracle announcement wasn't convincing enough, CBRE released another report saying that Nashville was leading the pack for high-tech job growth and office leasing momentum. Um, and to top things off, the Collier's Index, um, which tracks the health of Nashville's commercial real estate sector, saw a significant jump at the end of 2023, um, just three points shy of the index high, um, despite lots of competing factors in the industry. Um, so I shared all this to say that Nashville is doing pretty well, um, and especially during these tougher economic times. Um, despite a rapid growth, the city is not immune to national headwinds, and we still have some challenges we're facing. So this is when I'm gonna start to turn to our panelists, bring them in to talk about some of these trends and challenges that we're seeing. Um, so I'm gonna start off, Nashville saw its lowest number of commercial closings in over a decade last year. Um, but over the last five months, we've started to see a lot of activity picking up, especially among downtown assets. The one hotel and embassy suite sold um, last month for 530 million. Truist Plaza downtown sold to a California firm and Fifth Third Center is now on the market. Um, so we continue to see out of town investors and developers coming into the local market. Um, so Jeff, I wanted to start with you. When you look at Nashville's success and how we're doing right now, do we exist in a vacuum or what are the reasons that we're faring better than a lot of other major cities in the US? So good morning. Everyone in this room benefits from being in Nashville and doing business in this region. Um, we don't exist in a vacuum, but it is a very small group of cities, Austin, Denver, maybe Raleigh, maybe Charlotte, um, who are all benefiting from continued health. Um, it's a, really a function of a six-legged economic stool, continued population growth, continued job growth, and the rest of the country really struggling. And you saw it post-COVID with people moving here from California and the Midwest and the Northeast, and that's driving investor interest in our market. That's driving um, developers coming to our market. Um, so we're very, very fortunate. Laurel, when you look at the region's economy compared to other parts of the country, what, what stands out to you here in Nashville? Yeah, it's a great point. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because my, my work is focused on kind of national macro economy, uh, but I live in Nashville. And so it's, it's really hard for me sometimes to take off my Nashville goggles because life can just feel really different here. Uh, and, and I think one thing, it, it is really helpful to regularly ground my thinking in the understanding that a lot of what's going well in Nashville is actually the other side of a coin. Uh, there are places where headquarters are leaving, where populations are shrinking, where uh, populations are becoming less educated, less young, uh, less high earning. Uh, and, and a lot of that is this trade-off that we're seeing of folks moving into this part of the country. I think there are, there are a lot of factors at play supporting that. And I, I've been really excited to see, I think many of the engines that have continued to support that strength continue to exist and thrive. But certainly this, this conversation, what the mayor just talked about, you know, how can we how can we not rest on the fact that perhaps what fueled that growth up to this point is going to continue without us being really deliberate about making those investments? Yeah. 
Um, and Janet, kind of what, what do you see firing here in Nashville and maybe what, what do we need to keep our eye on in terms of the economy? Oh gosh, there's still so much that's firing in Nashville, <laughs> yeah. right? I was looking, it was interesting. I got our Collier's National Office Market Report in yesterday and it was so fascinating. So it ranked the top 12 uh, markets in the country largest. So you've got San Francisco, Chicago, LA, Every single one of them had negative net absorption uh, last quarter. So more people moving out. And the vacancies, if you get over to San Francisco, you're looking at a 23% vacancy, 20%. We're at about 16. But what was so interesting is Denver was the only one of those 15 markets, Nashville was not in that 15, that had positive net absorption in the first quarter. It was 154,000 square feet. Guess what? We had 150,000 square feet of positive absorption in the first quarter. So it isn't a cakewalk by any uh, stretch, but the office market is not the bloodbath that you're seeing. And you're still seeing these corporate reloads that are looking. Uh, people are just signing smaller leases is one of the things. So the office market isn't as terrible as in some other places. The other thing I would say, you talked a little bit about the um, drop in closings. Listen, if you're sitting on a great piece of real estate in Nashville, Tennessee right now, you know that this market will come back because the fundamentals of this economy are so strong. You know that interest rates are high now, so the deals don't pencil out, and you're not going to make as much money if you sell something in this economy. So the lack of closings, now uh, investment sales dropped 69% nationally over the last 12 months. So think about that office buildings, hotels, anything, 69% drop. Uh, and I think in Nashville, the reason you're seeing the slowdown is not because of weakness in the market, it's because of strength in the market, because people are going, I'm just gonna wait this thing out with our lovely friends at the Fed, who we would love to have drop interest rates very, very soon. <laughs> uh, but it's like, I've got this great asset, I'm sitting in this market that the fundamentals are the best in the country, so why would I sell? So I think there's a flip to the lack of closings, which is really a positive for Nashville, so. Yeah. Do I still have a cicada in my hair? <laughs> <laughs> I got hit in one on the way over here. Thank, thanks, Laurel, you're a friend. You're my friend, thank you. <laughs> um, so we'll get to the interest rates for sure. I know I know that's a hot topic, but um, first talking about kind of, you, and you said it, well, deals don't pencil. Um, it's become increasingly difficult to secure financing for projects over the past year or so, but there are still some massive construction loans that have been dropping. Um, Tony Giratana landed a 232.2 million loan for Nashville's tallest tower. Southwest Value Partners landed two um, construction loans over $200 million last year for Nashville Yards. So there's not as many as usual, but they're there. Um, so I'm gonna extend this. Um, Laurel, kind of what benchmarks are you watching to determine when the lending environment will normalize? I think number one is just a question of, in, that is not a rhetorical question. How do we define normal? Because we, we are coming off of a really long period where capital was extremely inexpensive. And I mean, this, this is a national story, but it is especially a Nashville story where there was just really ready uh, and available investor cash moving into the market. And, and I certainly ask myself the question of, you know, we now have executives of organizations, we have developers, we have leaders making these decisions who apart from this time have never been in leadership positions with interest rates above essentially zero. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do not necessarily think it is healthy for this community or for the economy for us to benchmark normal at at free money, mm -hmm. necessarily. So, so certainly I am looking for, and, and we'll get into the interest rate discussion, you know, as, as we see inflation continue to come down, I, I certainly see an equilibrium interest rate. It's something lower than where it is today. So, so normalizing is definitely going to a place where capital is more readily available. Ho hopefully we have kind of lender, more traditional lenders feeling more comfortable about what's on their balance sheet. We see you know, prices buyers and sellers agreeing on pricing, which I don't get a sense we really have. Nashville has maybe come a little bit closer than other parts of the country, but you know, there are some fundamentals that seem like, you know, this is okay, the economy is moving in a direction, these things will settle out to a normal, that normal might be different than what we considered normal a few years ago. I, 
I don't see any signals that suggest we're not moving in that direction. I think at a pretty healthy clip, uh, but but there certainly are still questions, and I think many of them. I mean, think about the office space. Many of them are still determined by things I don't think any of us know, which is how are we thinking about in-person work? How much space do we need for that? You know, answers around those questions, our experiences around what can even employers require their workers to do, those things are still in motion. Um, and, and so part of it is, I think my role in some ways is needing to recognize when is it that doing a bunch of number crunching and studying can actually bring us to an answer that's helpful, and when is the truth just we need to sit back and observe the market's still going to tell us what normal is and when we get there. Yeah. Um, Janet, in terms of looking at office space post-pandemic, we are still figuring this out. I mean, do you see us getting to a point? Are we there yet? Have we figured this out? Or when is that going to happen? What is the post-pandemic office space? So the post-pandemic office, and you hear it, you read it in every magazine, it's almost becoming a cliche, which is flight to quality. Yeah. And it's all about, look, if I'm going to get my employees back, because some of them really like working in their yoga pants at home. If, um, if I'm going to do that, I, ha I want to have an extraordinary workspace for them. And I want it to be a place where they can go out, you know, in front of Amazon, they've got a banana truck. You can get a banana all day long for free out in front of Amazon. Uh, but they want, you know, all the amenities, the walkability, the green roofs. They want to be able to work outside. So I think what you're going to see in the office market, and Jeff, you are such an expert on this, is the flight to quality. And then those class, class B minus C buildings, Jeff and I were having lunch a couple weeks ago, and strangely enough, there is going to be a point where they're just obsolete, right? I think you've got some downtown towers right now that nobody really wants to go into the 1970-something terrible parking, no walkable old building. And so I think we're going to see a shift, but I, mark my words, we will have a shortage of class AAA office space uh, by 2026. I believe, because Nashville Yards will be leased up. Um, uh, Newhoff has been going like crazy. Broadwest has become the, uh, the safe house <laughs> for companies that wanted to get away from some of the nut, the craziness downtown. And it's an extraordinary development. So I think that's what you're going to see. I don't think we're ever going back to the way it was before. Yeah. Um, and Jeff, I'd love to get some of your thoughts on this, what you're looking at in terms of office space and then also just like lenders checklist in general, what, uh, what kind of boxes do you need to tick in order to get financing? So based on the, uh, the last question, the continuum of lending has shifted. Um, banks used to have loans paid off by developer owners who would go to the permanent markets when interest rates were cost effective. Today, because interest rates have doubled, uh, we're choosing to not go permanently finance those assets, and banks are having to hold assets longer, which is creating the capital crunch within the banking industry. Uh, relative to office space, lenders can be choosy, and their, the debt service coverage tests are very stringent. The equity check that you have to write is very high, and so people are being selective. Um, over the last six months, we've been very fortunate to start an office building in Cool Springs, and we got a construction loan from Northwestern Mutual. The terms of that construction loan, I'm sort of embarrassed. I don't like them. Uh, it's very expensive, but we got a loan. We also bought an office building in Cool Springs uh, that KBS sold. KBS had to sell it because of their exposure and their office REIT in the West Coast. And so they had to raise cash to pay down the REIT credit line, and they chose to sell an asset in Nashville because there is some liquidity in this market. To Janet's point, developers are choosing to highly amenitize their projects and to try to work on things that are walkable, urban design, pedestrian friendly with lots of amenities because we're seeing you know, the employers move away from the days of the standalone fried egg office building. I think the opportunity for you all in this room is how do we go repurpose uh, all of the 70s and 80s vintage buildings Janet mentioned. We need to have other uses uh, to, to repurpose those buildings over time. 